The gut microbiome, the term used to describe your army of 100 trillion bacteria and microorganisms who all reside in your gut. Over the past few years, there's been quite the explosion of research showing us some pretty interesting things. This army residing right underneath your abdomen is considered by some to be a second, second brain. brain. What's even more interesting is there are claims that you could harness this supposed second brain to treat obesity, prevent cancer, cardiovascular diseases, and even things like autoimmune diseases. Imagine having a way to finally shed those pounds you've been trying to lose for so long, or just bulletproof your body against chronic diseases. There are quite a few factors that affect your gut microbiome, namely genetics, diet, physical activity, use of certain medications, particularly antibiotics, and even how your mother, or her surgeon in some cases, decided what the best way for you to be born was. Now it's been proposed by many that there exists a sort of gut-brain connection, with the explanation being that the bacteria affect how food is digested, and in turn how chemical messengers, as a result, will then communicate with the nervous system. So then, we'd expect to see this affecting our mood, behavior, and also potentially playing a role in neurological disorders such as depression or anxiety. But is there any merit to these claims? To gain some better insight, we can refer to this 2019 systematic review. Even this particular article talks about how many refer to the gut microbiota as an overlooked organ. Now, what's interesting here is, just like organ transplants, there's a study mentioned in this review which looked at fecal transplantation and its effects on mice. What they did in this study is they had patients suffering from major depressive disorder and then essentially moved their poop into the germ-free mice raised in a lab which would alter the gut microbiome of those mice. They'd also have a control group where the fecal transplantation from healthy control individuals was performed. The researchers observed that mice who received fecal transplantation from patients suffering from major depressive disorder began to exhibit depressive-like behaviors themselves, while the mice that received the healthy poop didn't. Additionally, we have some evidence from MRIs that there is an association between neural activity and gut microbiome composition, even in humans. Patients suffering from irritable bowel syndrome were split into two groups. One was given a probiotic and the other one was given a placebo as a control. FMRI analysis showed that patients administered with the probiotic had dampened responses to negative emotional stimuli in multiple brain areas. Furthermore, according to the questionnaires patients were given following the treatment, despite there being no reduction in IBS symptoms, the probiotic group saw lower depression scores, lower anxiety scores, and just higher overall quality of life scores. None of these results should necessarily be frowned at, but to some of you, it may already sound quite different from potentially overconfident promises and extrapolations many health gurus or health food companies sometimes make. For those of you wondering why this is, we need to examine the limitations of the two studies mentioned. In the first rodent fecal transplantation study, we need to be mindful of a few things. One, animal studies don't always transfer over to human subjects. Two, unhealthy gut bacteria, when transplanted, may potentially elicit negative mental health outcomes, but that is different from healthy gut bacteria eliciting positive health outcomes in patients following transplantation. Three, determining whether or not the mice are displaying depressive symptoms or not can be difficult. The article doesn't suggest that the researchers were unaware of which mice were the control group and which mice were the treatment group. This means that researchers may have been subconsciously biased if they were desiring or expecting a certain outcome. Potentially missing symptoms displayed by the control mice and then incorrectly noting down behaviors that weren't actually indicative of depressive symptoms in the treated mice. Now, the second study. The subjects were all patients suffering from irritable bowel syndrome, but the majority of people watching this video probably aren't. We don't know if the positive effects of this probiotic are exclusive to those with IBS or not. 
Moreover, if we want to start discussing this as a potential preventative treatment for healthy individuals, it's important to note that subjects were already suffering from mild to moderate anxiety and or depression. While this probiotic may be effective in reducing depressive symptoms in those who are already depressed, it doesn't necessarily mean that it will be a viable option when it comes to effectively preventing it. This means that with those caveats in mind, one could make an argument that the current evidence does suggest our gut microbiome certainly has the potential to impact neurological disorders, behavior, and just overall mental health. But this statement is very different from gut health gurus claiming we know picking the right tub of yogurt can have a profound impact on your mental health. The authors of this systematic review even explicitly state that there is currently no scientific consensus on this matter. It seems that we can't help but mention weight loss when it comes to conversations revolving around health nowadays. This is hardly surprising considering obesity is quickly becoming one of the biggest threats to our health in the modern world. With around two-thirds of the American population being either overweight or obese, the desire to lose weight has never been stronger amongst the general population. There also seems to be a growing message suggesting the significance of the gut microbiome, specifically in it supposedly being an obstacle for those trying to lose weight. You might have even come across it from social media influencers or health food and supplement companies talking about gut health along with the benefits that they say come alongside their product. But how much truth is there to this? Well, let's take a step back and look at what the main arguments behind this are. Promoters of this idea sometimes talk about following a microbiome diet, altering your entire nutritional approach to change your microbiome, which is supposedly then going to alter your body weight and fat and all the health consequences that, that will follow that. You'll find yourself looking at diets that instruct you to eliminate almost every food group you can think of to be frank, you're cutting out so many foods that you'll almost be left with an empty plate by the end of it. Common sense would tell us that this really isn't practical for most people. But let's suppose that you're really serious about your health and you want to take it to the next level. These diets also recommend supplementing with probiotics and prebiotics. But what are they? What do they do and how much does the science say they actually help? Well, for probiotics, they're basically the actual microorganisms you're ingesting, like the ones added to yogurt and prebiotics, think fiber, such as inulin, a soluble fiber found in many plants. There are also symbiotics and symbiotic supplements, which is basically just a combination of both probiotics and prebiotics. The goal of these supplements is to supposedly populate your gut with so-called healthy bacteria by introducing and feeding them. The logic then is that once they are there, your new healthy microbiome is then going to bring about positive health outcomes. Let's look at what human experiments in a more practical situation says, such as a meta-analysis of randomized controlled clinical trials comparing probiotic supplementation spanning 12 weeks or more. The results are actually kind of appalling. In a time span of over 12 weeks, the mean difference between the placebo group and the probiotic group was just 0.98 kilograms, or around two pounds. So while yes, there is a noticeable effect, it is important to ask yourself whether or not this effect size is going to be worth your money or not. There are also issues with using language that many of these microbiome diet articles use with words like repair, toxins, and instructing readers to avoid non-natural household cleaners. We need to acknowledge that just because something is natural, it doesn't mean that it's good. Apple seeds are completely natural, but consuming them would not be a good idea at all. Snake venom is also completely natural, but you don't want to inject that into your body. This is what we call an appeal to nature fallacy. There's no logical reason to believe that just because something is natural, it will inherently be beneficial to your gut health, and therefore your overall health. On top of this, we know that some of the most important factors affecting gut microbiota composition is actually birth, delivery, and breastfeeding. The vaginal canal exposes the baby to a lot of bacteria which helps with establishing the gut microbiota. And by the age of three, most humans already have a gut microbiome composition similar to that of an adult. 
That's not to say that you can't change your gut microbiome at all, but that is just another key point that we have to acknowledge before jumping on these diets. The closest thing I could find is this systematic review looking at type 1 diabetes, which is an autoimmune disease, and its association with the gut microbiota. It's important to establish that we know for a fact there are very, very strong genetic factors that play into type 1 diabetes. However, there is some evidence suggesting that colonizing bacteria may play a role. Out of 26 studies investigated, almost all of them, barring two, confirmed some sort of association between type 1 diabetes and gut microbiota dysbiosis. However, this is where we run into another problem. Many of these studies did not clarify whether type 1 diabetes changes the gut microbiome or if the gut microbiome itself increases the risk of type 1 diabetes. Additionally, it's important to acknowledge that when an individual suffers from type 1 diabetes, they have to alter their diet in unique ways. So, if we've already established that the gut microbiome can be influenced by diet, these gut microbiota associations may potentially be the result of similar dietary patterns that diabetics just have to follow. Now hopefully it's easier to understand why we can't go around saying that some generic name brand probiotic supplement is going to have a profound impact on type 1 diabetes. With all of this in mind, where does the science stand on this issue thus far? Is there evidence to suggest the potential benefits in taking care of your gut microbiome and what practices are likely to be effective? It actually comes full circle and down to the boring basics. Consuming fibrous vegetables, whole grains, exercising, that is what is shown to be associated with better gut microbiota and health outcomes. This is also where we can again appreciate the difficulty in deciphering causation. What causes what? Those things are known to produce good health outcomes. The fact that they are associated with a supposedly healthy gut actually doesn't tell us a lot. Anyways, that's all I have for you guys on this topic. There's actually a lot more research I couldn't quite fit into this video because it was either too wordy, went off on a tangent, or just wasn't super relevant. However, if you'd like to see all that, you can by going over to my Patreon page. Over there, you can gain access to all sorts of behind the scenes footage, additional discussions and research, and many more cool features like Q&As that I plan on adding soon. I hope you all have a great day and got your fix of intellectually transparent and hopefully entertaining content.